Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm Sarah Higdusti. I'm the Deputy Director of Win Without War. Before we get started, I wanted to acknowledge that I'm in Evanston in Illinois on the land of the Council of Three Fires. I wanted to pay my respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to the elders of the lands of everyone on this call. As a proud Iranian, Australian, American, and yes, if you have spotted the accent, that is where it comes from. This conversation feels incredibly important and timely. I've been a proud feminist and activist for much of my life. And for me, that drive has come from seeing others in my family, in my community, in Iran and throughout the diaspora, resist, struggle and give their all to creating change. When we talk about US foreign policy towards Iran, so often, we do not talk about those stories. And that flattening of Iran and Iranians is part of what we need to combat, not just to create better foreign policy, but also help break down the racism and the white supremacy that makes collective punishment an option and even acceptable in some circles. Be that in the case of the Muslim ban, or in the case of broad-based sanctions that are in place on Iran right now. I'm deeply honored to be joined by an incredible group of speakers here today, and for us to explore the impact sanctions are having on people in Iran, and in particular to highlight the effects they're having on civil society and individuals and groups who are trying to create change. We're also going to be talking through a little bit about how, why meaningful sanctions relief has proved so elusive so far. I also want to name that many of you who have joined us already sent us through questions beforehand. And one of the most common questions we got was, how can I help? How can I help create change? And I just wanna let you all know that we will be giving you multiple ways that you can help throughout this call. So please stay tuned for that. To begin and to kick us off, I want to introduce Tyler Cullis, who is a prominent sanctions expert and a lawyer who practices and specializes in this area of the law, in this area of sanctions law. Tyler's analysis and work in this space has been incredibly insightful, and invaluable to our work. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tyler. To start us off, I was wondering if you could help ground us a little bit in an overview of the sanctions that are happening in Iran right now and why the attempts to reduce their impact on people in Iran has proved so challenging. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks, Sarah and the team at Win Without War for putting this together. Um, this is a actually a, a supremely timely issue. Um, the Biden administration is currently engaged in a uh, review of the humanitarian impact of U.S. sanctions, which, as far as I'm aware, is the first of its kind, um, making the kind of outside advocacy work that Win Without War doing have added importance, considering the potential for all of us to have a really immediate policy impact today. Um, the sanctions regime that the United States imposes on Iran is one without any modern historical parallel. Um, you know, 20 years ago, there was a lot of concern, um, a, a lot of concern about the humanitarian impact that U.S. sanctions caused Iraq. In that instance, the U.S. had imposed an embargo on Iraq. Um, sanctions since that time have um, evolved in substantial ways. Um, it's no longer that the U.S. merely maintains an embargo preventing trade itself with Iran, but the United States imposes what is effectively uh, a unilaterally imposed international boycott of Iran, meaning that the United States virtually blockades broad sectors of Iran's economy, not just from itself, but from the outside world. Um, when we talk about the humanitarian impact in Iran, really a core issue that a lot of people take a look at is you know, the sanctions targeting Iran's banks and its financial sector because those are the sanctions that really inhibit um, humanitarian trade with Iran and lead to the kind of medicine and medical and food shortages that we see in Iran. Um, you know, put plainly, all of Iran's banks are sanctioned under one authority or another, 
um, Iran's entire financial sector is sanctioned itself under multiple authorities. Um, and these sanctions, you know, taken together have led to the almost complete isolation of Iran's banking sector from the outside world. Um, U.S. sanctions offering a choice for foreign banks, um, either sever links entirely with Iran's financial institutions or face total exclusion from the U.S. financial system. And, you know, in a world in which most trade internationally is dollarized, um, exclusion from the U.S. financial system for a foreign bank is a, you know, it would mean death. Um, you know, so the isolation you know, of Iran's banking sector um, from the outside world means that basic financial transfers, including those in support of trade and humanitarian goods, cannot be effectuated because foreign banks are unable to maintain links um, to Iran's financial institutions. Um, and I can, you know, tell you speaking from experience as someone who practices in this area of law and regularly advises um, parties engaged in humanitarian trade or seeking to engage in humanitarian trade with Iran, it is exceptionally difficult to find a foreign bank that is willing to handle those financial transfers. Um, you know, there's four, you know, salient causes um, to the humanitarian impact um, of sanctions in Iran um, that I wanna run through kind of quickly here. But, you know, one is that um, broad-based sanctions that target in, entire sectors of Iran's economy, including some of the most critical actors in that economy, such as Iran's central bank and all of its major financial institutions, will inevitably cause substantial disruptions to basic trade, including trade in humanitarian goods, such as food, medicine, and medical devices. Um, I see a lot of discussion about, you know, whether, you know, the United States can provide more clarification with respect to certain exceptions created in law for humanitarian trade. In my view, it is simply not practical to maintain a broad-based sanctions regime and expect to be able to make tailored carve-outs that mitigate the humanitarian impact of those sanctions. I think, you know, in, 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 in practicing in this area of law, being deeply familiar with its modern application of, US, of sanctions, there's just no historical evidence that such carve-outs, whether they be license authorizations, humanitarian exceptions, or other exemptions, are capable of fixing the problems caused by these sanctions. The second part is that, you know, even if we were to believe that a humanitarian exceptions, you know, would facilitate trade and humanitarian goods with Iran, despite the impact of broad-based sanctions, there is a failure. The United States does not have a blanket humanitarian exception in as a matter of law. There are certain humanitarian exceptions in US sanctions laws and regulations, but those exceptions exclude dealings with parties that are sanctioned under the US's counterterrorism or its counter WMD authorities. Now, the problem is that almost all of Iran's major banks are designated under those exact authorities. Um, the Trump administration imposed terrorism related sanctions on Iran's central bank. Um, and in a particularly egregious action, it targeted in October, 2018, a private Iranian bank, Bank Parsian, that had been intimately involved and was well known to facilitate trade in humanitarian goods. Um, so, you know, absent a blanket humanitarian exemption, one that can be extended cross programmatically across US sanctions programs, um, it's simply not going to be possible um, to, to um, utilize limited exceptions to facilitate humanitarian trade. Third is that. There's a bit more basic problem, which is that any license authorizations or humanitarian exceptions rely entirely on the, the good faith of commercial entities, commercial financial institutions to take advantage of those authorizations or humanitarian exceptions. The problem is, and I've worked with them quite a bit, is that commercial banks simply don't see the value in facilitating transfers in support of humanitarian trade, even where such transfers may be lawful, considering the substantial liabilities those being legal, reputational, that could result from facilitating that trade. There have been a lot of proposals as to how to resolve these issues, including the United States government or the Federal Reserve taking on some, and facilitating some of this trade in humanitarian goods. Um, but for the for the U.S. government to impose these sanctions and to put the to put the onus on commercial financial institutions to facilitate trade in humanitarian good is just not likely to happen. 
And fourth, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about a potential U.S. return to the JCPOA and the Biden administration lifting some of these broad-based sanctions. There's uh, three basic problems that will linger, even if there is a U.S. return to the JCPOA. Um, while for sure the proposed sanctions relief for Iran would be a positive development and would, you know, could help create openings for humanitarian trade, the fact remains that Iran would remain a substantial area of risk for banks due to a number of reasons. One is that there will be a substantial number of sanctions that will be maintained, even if the United States returns to the JCPOA. Two, there will be significant hesitance on the part of foreign banks to resume links with Iran's financial institutions in a JCPOA world. Um, and third is the danger that a future administration will once again pull the rug out from under banks' feet, withdraw from the JCPOA and reimpose sanctions on Iran. Even today, 15 Republican senators sent letters to all of Iran, to all of the United States' um, major business groups and organizations, including the Chamber of Commerce, warning that if any one of their constituent businesses decided to take advantage of any openings created by the sanctions lifting, that they would be mistaken in doing so. Um, and so, you know, those are the four real areas that are inhibiting um, trade and humanitarian goods and will continue to in the future. Thank you so much for that, Tyler. And the thing that really stood out to me there was two things. One, that when you have these broad-based sanctions, even if you're trying to carve out humanitarian exceptions, by the nature of it, they become more cosmetic rather than effective. And then how much then you're relying on commercial entities and their goodwill in order to do this and how so much of this context makes that not palatable, shall we say. Um, so with that, I also, I wanna introduce our next speaker, Susan Tamosibi, who is the executive director of Femina. Susan has worked within Iran and outside of Iran for over a decade on women's rights. While Susan is incredibly modest and is probably going to cringe a little bit when I say this, she is one of the most prominent women's rights advocates in this space and someone whose work I am deeply grateful for every day. I read an article that she co-authored in the New York Times recently that talked about the impacts of sanctions on women and highly recommend it to anyone listening on this call. Susan John, thank you so much for being here. Will you give us a little bit of an overview of civil society in Iran and share some of what you know about the impacts the sanctions have had on their work? Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah John, for that generous introduction. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here today. I'm glad that so many people are interested in hearing about the situation of Iranians and how they can help alleviate some of their some of the pressures that they face. They face many, many pressures, but this is this is one one of the pressures that perhaps Americans can help alleviate a bit. Um, so a lot of the people who are on this call today probably don't really understand or know that there is, you know, a civil society inside of Iran that's up operating, um, that it's actually been around and it's had periods where it's been extremely vibrant. It's still pretty active and operating. So I think it's important to give you a little bit of a background of what that civil society looks like. And I'll do this very in a very cursory and uh, quick manner, since I know I don't have a lot of time, but if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer it. So I would, I, and I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about the press and all of that, because all of that falls into civil society as well. But mostly I'm going to talk about not, non-governmental organizations, or as we know them here, nonprofit organizations that are working to provide services or education or awareness raising. And so according to figures, there are about 14,000 registered organizations. This is, I think, a, a really high figure, probably about half of them are, are operational and they fall into several different categories. One is charity organizations that provides charitable services to uh, marginalized communities or communities in need from medical care to you know, other sorts of charitable 
services like uh, food and you know uh, uh, support for education, housing, etc. Um, many of the charity organizations work from a religious perspective, including Muslims, but also we have religious organizations, Christian religion organizations, religious organizations, Jewish religious organizations that have been doing this for a long time, and you know they work with with people who are vulnerable and poor, um, and. Um, then we have service delivery organizations. I would classify them as a little bit more um, uh, technical. So they're providing services in, in certain fields, whether it's services to people who have specialized diseases or services like as shelter services for women who are um, dealing with violence against women or other types of you know, educational services, services to mothers for their you know, children. Um, then we have the sort of more modern NGOs that are much more specialized and um, they work a lot more on prevention. So they're working in a range of fields, including, for example, environmental rights, environmental issues. Of course, the environmental sector has faced a lot of repression, is not as active <laughs> recently. Um, and we have, you know, they're working on women's rights, uh, human rights. Many of the rights based organizations tend not to be registered, they're informal because Iran also has a more securitized approach to. Um, to um, not the nonprofit sector, the NGO sector, especially the rights community. But there are a lot of informal groups that have been working for a long time, holding the state accountable on its rights violations or working to promote women's rights, human rights, et cetera. So what's happened in, um, and I should say that, you know, I, when I talk about the, Iran has been sanctioned for, for decades, but these particular sanctions that were actually designed during the Obama administration to force Iran to come to the table are very different. And I think Tyler talked about how they're so different. They really impacted Iranian community almost immediately. I was in Iran in 2010 when the sanctions were imposed and I could feel like, for example, immediately the medicine I was looking for couldn't be found because of shipping sanctions. So they really impacted a broad range of Iranians. And um, for civil society who was, you know, when I, at certain point they were, you know, especially the women's movement that I'm very close to, for example, was advocating for election of women into high level positions, making sure that women are um, being uh, appointed as um, as ministers or um, a civil society that was, you know, take, doing visits to prisons to hold the state accountable or doing education on rights of um, prisoners, et cetera. So really dealing with sort of rather high level issues because of the sanctions and because Iranians have become poorer and sicker, and especially since the imposition of these last round of sanctions with um, the Trump administration are dealing with issues at a much more basic level. So working on prevention of violence against women, for example, or, uh, or other types of more, what you would classify as higher level um, uh, activism has given way to the sort of much more basic types of activism, whereas the majority of people are really, the majority of civil society is really engaged in providing uh, uh, financial support to the families and the women and the communities that they work with, helping them access medical care, helping them pay for their rent and their housing, basically helping Iranians that they work with survive. So we're not, you know, we, and, and also I think communities that are struggling so hard to survive, basic survival, they're not educated. They're not interested in education and awareness raising and even skills building, which is some of the work that civil society and Iran was doing, they they really just want to make rent. They want to have take care of their children, etc. So this is one level. So the level at which civil society was operating is increased. It has become much more reduced. I think also it's important to talk about the impact that sanctions are having on civil society activists. They're no different than Iranians. So they've also become poorer alongside other Iranians. So many of them are not interested in their volunteer work because Iranian civil society is largely a volunteer sector. So they're not, if they're working three jobs, they don't have time to volunteer. So civil society is being depleted of its, of its forces, of its activists. Um, and then also the state has become, has taken a much more securitized approach. As I mentioned before, that there is great repression already inside Iran, but activists have worked very hard despite that repression. But I think when the state feels a lot of pressure in this way, that it's going to take any form of dissent uh, and treat it much more 
uh, uh, crack, down it, uh, crack down on it much more severely. So we've seen also a rise in repression and civil society in Iran has also become, if Iranian state has become isolated, civil society in Iran has also become extremely, extremely um, isolated. So um, I think that we see that there, so just to summarize, so there civil society that was working you know, to promote sort of like rather high level human rights demands is now working really just to make, make meet basic needs. A lot of civil society activists are pulling out of their volunteer work because they just can't afford to do it. Many of them are hopeless. Maybe they're leaving the country. And then um, lastly, also that they're dealing with a lot more repression. So poverty, isolation and state repression is, is tends to be what civil society inside the country is dealing with. Thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for that, Susan John. And I think the point you just made about sanctions and repression is one we don't hear about enough as well. So when seeing how these broad-based sanctions and their link to increasing repression is also one that is both hard to hear and important to acknowledge. Um, with that, I also want to introduce our next speaker, Mani Mustafi who is the director of Neon Group and who has over a decade of experience in organizing for human rights. His unwavering commitment to human rights is something that I've been inspired by daily. And what I have always loved about Money's analysis is how he looks at human rights through the lens of political and civil rights, as well as economic and social rights. Mani, thank you so much for joining us today. And my ask to you is, can you share a bit more about how these sanctions are impacting people's rights in Iran in that broader context of economic rights and impacting their ability to live with dignity? Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, this, it's, it's really nice to be invited to this important talk today. And I think the concept of dignity is sort of central to um, what I wanna focus on um, with my time. I, it's the sanctions are framed and they're legally structured to be um, economic um, blockades or embargoes or whatever you want to call them on the Iranian state and major Iranian institutions. But the problem is, is when you live in a um, nation state with a modern economy, you are always dependent on your government on some levels and you're always dependent on your major institutions dependent in the most basic sense to make sure that the you know, trains run on time to get you your food, to get you to your job, to get you to the bank. So when we talk about sanctions on Iran, one way to frame it is sanctions on you know, the Iranian economy, but the other way to frame it is, is sanctions on 80 million people. The, and we're talking about sanctions on 80 million people in a vastly undemocratic country where they have very little influence over the behavior of the state. So these are not people who their suffering then can translate into some policy from the Islamic Republic that um, the US government likes. So these sanctions are causing these sort of macroeconomic um, uh, downturns. So GDP per capita has um, plummeted since 2010, oil exports, have been um, slashed. General import exports have been slashed, which means that um, uh, that it's in contributed to inflation and and a, and, a, and a sort of shortcoming in household budgets. Um, I always see the most important indicator when you're sort of talking about what is happening um, in Iran to ordinary people is the value of the currency, the real, has dropped almost seventy percent. So imagine all of you, if your income, if your income is dropped by 70% in terms of buying power, or your bank account is now worth 70% more in terms of your ability to buy things that are imported, which a lot of things we buy every day are imported. Well, it's no different for Iranians. So once the currency is devalued, it has ripple effect throughout the whole economy and in people's lives. Um, it's also contracted government spending. The Iranian government is, are, are no angels. They have um, corruption and mismanagement. They are bigoted against certain groups. They favor urban areas against um, 
uh, rural areas, they favor ethnic majorities over ethnic minorities. All of that's true, but we know that when a government spends less, less money is flowing through the economy, less money is flowing through the economy, people are earning more, they have less economic opportunities and it affects everybody. So government spending is really hurt. And like a lot of governments, they look to cut, find places to make cuts. And that also includes social programs and subsidies. We saw the same thing in Europe, for example, after um, the Great Recession in 2018, there was all sorts of austerity programs. Iran is no different. These aren't policies I um, support, but these are policies that are sort of uh, natural outcomes of this type of economic crisis. The other thing that's happened is that fuel prices, gas prices have risen. Even though Iran is a, um, an oil producer, it ex imports a lot of its gasoline. So when shipping is increased, that means consumer goods, the prices go up for everybody, including things like food. We've seen a, um, since 2010, when sanctions have imposed, poverty rates have doubled in rural areas, and they've increased about 60% in um, urban areas. That's really significant because prior to sanctions, Iran saw 20 straight years of poverty decline, the rate of poverty declining. So within the short time of sanctions being imposed, we saw a spike. Just the last, um, the year from the time that the Trump administration reimposed sanctions under the um, uh, maximum pressure campaign to the start of the coronavirus um, pandemic, which of course has its own dramatic economic impacts, um, 3.2 million Iranians fell into poverty in just those two years. 3.2 million Iranians. Um, and the poverty rates have all sorts of um, impacts. So for example, um, people are facing food insecurities and potential health outcomes that come from food insecurities really in a, in a way that hasn't been seen in a long time in Iran. So what is happening is that people are substituting um, higher priced foods such as um, meat, dairy, vegetables for cheaper starches. You know, we have done, we've conducted surveys in Iran of working class families and we're hearing things like families saying like, we primarily just eat potatoes because we can't even afford rice. So rice is now, you know, too expensive for people. Um, we haven't eaten meat in three years in our families. These are co common things. Um, there's also like increased reliance on charities, people going to the mosques, which they've never done. One very common thing that people are doing to cope with the economic crisis is that they are um, uh, moving. So they move to cheaper housing, they move out of their central areas into, into suburbs, where in Iran the suburbs tend to be a lot cheaper than the cities. Um, and they uh, have trouble making ends meet, for example, for medical expenses. So we interviewed a family that said they hadn't visited the doctor in several years until their kid got sick enough that they had to sell off their air conditioner to be able to pay for the doctor. Um, uh, people say they can't take care of decaying teeth or they have to make a, decisions between rent and paying for their um, met, uh, uh, dental expenses. So these are like huge impacts. And also the other things is, it impacts things beyond what we traditionally would think of as economic impacts. Just like we've started to see in a lot of countries under COVID and the economic crisis of COVID, you know, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence, for example, that domestic violence rates have gone up within Iran because of, um, because of the economic hardship, putting stresses on family, leading to um, higher rates of abuse. And it's been sort of dramatically felt across the um, entire society. So I think it's important that when we talk about human rights in Iran, there's often like really um, kind of sort of talking points that US government officials and human rights defenders come to all the time, the situation of the press, the situation of internet freedom, the situation of um, women and, and gender discrimination and all of those things are extremely valuable. Most of those are how I spend 90% of my day. But the one thing that the US has the most direct control over the US government is, is its sanctions policies and the 
the harm that its sanctions policies are causing to the basic dignity, as you said, Sara, and livelihoods, um, the, the food on the table, the food to go to school, the food to buy your kids new clothes that basically make up sort of foundational life. So all of this is, is, is in crisis now. And um, sanctions are a unique and um, significant com contributor to that situation, unfortunately. And hopefully, um, if we get, if we have JCPOA reentry, some of the legal um, um, obstacles could be lifted, but there are all these sort of extra legal obstacles in, in terms of the fear of banking sector and these things that Tyler referred to. And if those aren't part of our strategy to make sanctions relief not simply a, um, a relief on paper, but a relief in terms of people's lives, ordinary people's lives, so that, you know, Biden very eloquently said that their grievance is with the Iranian government and not the people and they support the people. Well, the best way to do that is to make sure that sanctions relief is meaningful and, and impacts um, people on a very basic level. Thank you so much for that money. And some of those stories that you shared around the spike in poverty and the impacts it's having on the people's ability to go to doctors. I know that really hit me on an emotional level. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I also know that, and I just wanna say thank you to all the panelists for that amazing presentation. We're going to go into questions now from people who are watching. If you do have a question, feel free to type it in the question box. I'm going to start off one of the most common questions we got from people who RSVP to this webinar was how they can help. And we're going to be talking a little bit about how they can help with sanctions relief a little bit later in the call. But I also wanted to ask the panel, are there specific ways that you think people watching this can help in particular with the human rights situation in Iran? So I'll go ahead and answer. And I just want to build a little bit upon, I wanted to mention this, but my time ran out and civil society, but I want to build a little bit upon what Mari was saying, because I think it's really important. And these are some of the things that have consistently really moved me. And if, if they upset you, Sarah, you can imagine. I hear about this all the time from my colleagues in Iran, things like, you know, uh, uh, one activist that I reached out to talked about how the community that they work with very sort of impoverished um, community and that, you know, just in the last month that they were working, three of the families that they're working with, the heads of the household committed suicide because they couldn't meet their economic needs. So this is, when we talk about that, I think that Mani brought it home a little bit more in terms of how it impacts people, but I think it's really important to talk about. We're not talking about um, policies in this very abstract way. This really impacts people's lives. And we're we're also doing, we're doing that research with Mani together, but we're also doing other research reaching out to civil society groups. And some of the things that they've noticed is that the that the consumption patterns in these poor communities have changed. Mani mentioned that, but when you go into the stores, you can't find the same things in the sort of the uh, lower economic class neighborhoods that than that you can in the upper class. And everything is packaged in like sort of a one-time use. So a small bit of rice, a small bit of cheese with brands that nobody's really heard of. So there are groups that are catering to this poverty. This is how serious it is and how people anticipate that it's sustainable. And there, you know, there are charities that used to sort of engage in providing loans for education or educational services, et cetera. Now they're they're collecting money, just this is like a regular thing. They're collecting money to pay off the debt that people have for purchase of food. People are buying bread on a payment plan. And this is, this is, these are some of the issues that the charity organizations are dealing with with their with their communities. And uh, you know, and it's also forcing civil society to do strange things like everybody else, medical care, medical care providers, etc. Everybody is sort of turned to some sort of smuggling, right? So they go to other countries to bring in medical supplies that they need for their 
for the communities that they serve, for their patients, et cetera. Or for example, one of the things that we found out is that many of these even international organizations couldn't transfer in money to pay for their staff. So you can just imagine what that does for, for communities, you know, for civil regular Iranian civil society, how they're dealing with some of this. So I think one of the most important things for me is the banking sanctions because, and I know that these are very difficult to lift because with the Trump administration specifically, they did it. So they designated it as terrorism to make it extremely difficult to, to lift. But this creates a lot of problems on the humanitarian front. And I'll let Tyler talk about that. And whoever I say it to, everybody just assumes that, oh, well, you know, Iran and the US are talking, they're gonna lift the sanctions and it's gonna be, it's gonna be fine. So let's go and pressure Iran on the on the human rights situation and see that. But this really every and most of the people I talk to inside the country and these are rights activists who've been in prison for seven years. So they have no there's no love loss between them and the, the state. But they say that people's livelihoods is also a human rights community and we need to pay attention to this. So I think just because the US and Iran are talking doesn't mean that these sanctions are going to be lifted quickly and that the pressure on Iranians is going to be alleviated. So I think I, I want to both drive it home in terms of the pressure that they're feeling, but that it's still going to take a long time for these people to recover. And, and I think uh, I, Mani also mentioned with COVID too, a lot of uh, civil society activists are seeing that kids are being pulled out of school. So these are, these are intergenerational changes and impact that we're, it's going to take us decades to recover from. So a whole slew of kids that are uneducated because of poverty and COVID and, um, you know, I just wanted to add that there. Um, and we do have a comment from someone who's watching, Roxana mentioned, why don't we call economic rights human rights? And I think one thing we are trying to pull out in this conversation is how economic rights are also part of that human rights narrative and how these sanctions are impacting people's ability to live with dignity as well. Um, so I wanted to pull that out. And also if anyone else wanted to talk about, is there anything specific people watching on this call can do on the human rights front? And if not, I'll move on to the next question. I mean, I think that, um... It's important to recognize that for the most part, um, US and Western based human rights organizations that many of us might support and be members of like Amnesty International, they do a decent job of, of bringing a lot of attention to um, civil political rights. So um, Iran's unlawful execution, Iran's uh, repression of minority groups, violence against protesters, um, imprisonment of activists. These things are grave systematic problems in Iran. And we see both, I think, in terms of um, Western-based human rights organizations and governments like the US government or um, the EU. There's a lot of um, strong focus on these things in a, in a way that we should applaud and is, is, is positive. Um, and, and there's a lot of support for civil society actors and change makers in Iran, sometimes moral support, um, sometimes trying to uh, raise their, uh, their issues when they're in prison and see how they can be um, released. And these are all things that we welcome. And, uh, but what we see is when it comes to economic social rights and when it comes to sanctions relief, which is the US now actually taking an action on of its own, as opposed to criticizing the Iranian government's actions, which it does quite well, also sort of reflecting on the human rights impact of its own policies and laws. That's where we see the shortcoming. So the Biden administration has a level of commitment that should be noted and um, appreciated towards trying to return to diplomacy. I mean, the crisis of American diplomacy is a whole other thing, but we have to get to a place where we can sign treaties to avoid conflict and that those treaties mean something or else we will be in perpetual war forever. But um, that aside, um, the Biden administration's like return to JCPOA seems to be sincere, but there's a larger American political climate that's driven by special interests, that's driven by um, uh, like a sort of like hawkish ideologies 
that basically wants to stop that return to diplomacy. And that return to diplomacy, if stopped, means a return, which means that sanctions relief won't even be lift, won't even be a figurative thing like we're talking about. We're worried about it just being on paper. It won't even just be relief on paper. Um, so I think I, really addressing Congress and making sure that Congress is not an obstacle to JCPOA and Congress is not an obstacle to a change of behavior by the US Treasury Department that is trying to facilitate um, or sort of create assurances that like basic trade, humanitarian trade, um, access to vaccines for COVID, which is now a current problem that we're the Iran, Iran is facing, that those things become reality. And one place where I think we have impact is as ordinary citizens is changing a narrative in a way that forces Congress to at least um, consider or be countered when it's sort of just doing the bidding of certain ideological um, factions within the US, um, uh, within Washington. So I think that that's a really important one. So I know everybody says, you know, call up your congressman, but this is an area where it would really improve the lives of 80 million people. Absolutely. We have, oh, Tyler, did you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, I defer to Susan and Mani on how people can especially help in this area. Um, but, you know, one thing that I did want to raise is, you know, I work with a lot of organizations, including um, groups similar to the kind that Mani and Susan themselves run. Um, and, you know, one thing that they themselves have to negotiate is how to figure out how they themselves can comply with sanctions while providing whatever humanitarian work they do with respect to Iran. Um, and that could be a substantial drain on resources for a lot of organizations that are, are on shoestring budgets and now they need to hire a, a lawyer like myself to figure out how they can either get authorization from the US government to engage in that work in Iran um, or how they can, you know, or how they've made their self determination that what they're doing is actually compliant with existing law. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to raise that because it's actually a wrinkle, which is that the US maintains a embargo with Iran that actually prohibits US persons, including all of us from, you know, interacting with Iran, even at the most basic level of supporting Iranian civil society or human rights work there. Yeah. I again, just want to highlight that, that on this call, we have incredible individuals who are doing really important work, following them, supporting their organizations is also a really great way to get involved in that human rights work. We have two questions from people who are watching. Um, two questions that I'm going to combine because I think they're very similar. And the first question from Susan is, I thought the point of economic sanctions was to force Iran to negotiate. That isn't, that doesn't seem to be happening. Can the panel comment a little bit on that? And Carol is asking about what could some potential alternatives to sanctions look like? Yeah. Susan, do you want to go first? No, why don't you go ahead and then I'll and then I'll talk about. It. Yeah, I mean, look, I'll take the last question first. You know, what's what's an alternative? Um, you know, oddly enough, some of the most um the biggest proponents for sanctions on Iran, if you look at what they were writing 20 years ago, they were writing the exact opposite thing. So, you know, there was, if, if you think of the strongest proponents of sanctions, for instance, during the Trump administration, the Trump administration considered sanctions as a means to foment regime change in Iran, that it would, it would cause such disruption um, to basic supplies for the general population in Iran, that the general population would revolt against their leadership and, you know, we, we, we'd get uh, uh, um, some kind of regime change. And, you know, that was the governing theory in some respects. Um, but if you look at what they were writing 20, 25 years ago, they were writing the exact opposite. They said, well, what we should actually be doing is opening trade up with Iran, because that's the way, um, that's the way to create regime change. Um, and, you know, if, you know, which indicates, you know, why I don't adopt either theory that they presented. Um, it does indicate that um, sanctions aren't the only means of, of is, isn't the only policy that the United States could adopt. Um, the United States can do many things and it can imagine a, a, broad, reop a broad opening to Iran 
that allowed for US civil society and Iranian civil society to interact with each other that decided we don't need to fence Iran off from the entire world, that it is actually more aligned with US interest um, for Iranian civil society to have free access on unhindered to the outside world, um, to be able to take in ideas and to share their own ideas. Um, you know, I, I, for instance, one area I work with is the tech community in Iran. Um, and the tech community is a very burgeoning, blossoming area. It's off, some of it is underground because of Iranian government censorship. But nonetheless, there's a lot of great things happening on the ground there that if they were allowed to interact with, say, Silicon Valley or something like that, um, you know, there'd be a lot of room for cooperation between the two. And that could really lead to some, you know, really empower some different kinds of people in Iran. So Sanjan, I believe you wanted to speak to this too. Yeah, so I think that you, there's a question that talks about repression, right? Um, so yes, I mean, it, of course, I, I just really want to add that, you know, sanctions are a big part of the, the worsening economic situation inside the country, but also it's mismanagement um, and corruption as well. So I, I do want to say that. Um, I think certainly if we're talking to the Iranian government, we have a different message. But here we're talking to Americans and the US government. So that's why the so much of the focus is on the sanctions. And I think many of the proponents of these sanctions have actually taken credit for the worsening and near collapse of the Iranian economy as well. So I do want to point that out. Um, uh, sure, repression has been a big part of the, you know, of the state's approach towards civil society. And whenever the state is under a lot of pressure, it becomes much more repressive. And none of these sanctions that are now up for negotiations as part of the JCPOA have actually been implemented for human rights or for repressive practices of the state. They all have to do with Iran's nuclear program and Iran's regional um, activities. And none of that has stopped. Like re Iran's regional activities hasn't stopped. And what's happened, even if some people claim that these sanctions have weakened the Iranian government, the Iranian state, the IRGC, yes, that may be true. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think it's necessarily stopped their activities, but it, maybe it's weakened them a little bit, but it's also weakened Iranian society. And so if we're looking at civil society in Iranian society to make positive change when their ability to make that change has been considerably weakened and their position vis-a-vis -vis the state that's repressive has been weakened even further, then we can't be looking for and be very hopeful about positive change. When civil society can't organize, right? And I talked about all the reasons why they can't organize because they're dealing with very low level issues. They're dealing with survival issues. They're extremely hopeless in terms of their ability to have impact. They're not able to, you know, they're, they're not able to continue their activism. Then you might have people who, because of poverty or because of anger or because of frustration, they pour out into the streets. And that kind of uh, public protest, I think, if it's not organized, if it doesn't have specific demands, if it's not sustainable and it can be crushed with, you know, through crackdowns and through bullets, et cetera, it's not going to lead to positive change. So I think that we have to sort of dissect this and take this, that there's a lot of language that tries to justify these sanctions based on human rights violations, but they're not there for human rights violations. The human rights sanctions tend to target individual violators of human rights. And that's, you know, that that's fine. We're talking about broad-based economic sanctions that weaken Iranian society. And they have weakened Iranian society. And you know, the the IRGC and people associated with the state, they've actually been growing fatter and richer and more powerful because they have all the power and they have all the money, and they're making a lot more money and gaining a lot more power from brokering these sanctions. So I think we see astronomical numbers that with zeros that we can never, I don't even know how many zeros they are of corruption cases that actually the Iranian state is actually bringing up. This is just what we're hearing about that the Iranian state has decided to take up. So there are people who are making so much money that are associated with the state. I couldn't broker sanctions if I lived in Iran. I'm, you know, so who's brokering these sanctions and who's becoming richer and more powerful. It's actually those very same people that we claim these sanctions are targeting. So I just wanted to put that out there. I hope that that, that has kind of cleared a little bit the, the confusion that exists with respect to repression and 
you know. And one comment I also want to make here, one thing that I've also really found outrageous when looking at broad-based sanctions and this whole idea that if we sanction the population, then they will resist. The very idea that you need U.S. foreign policy for resistance, like that's always felt like it has erased generations of people who have participated in resistance and struggle in Iran and seeing their impacts now that are going the other way, I think is a testament to that as well. There are a lot of questions coming up. Obviously this conversation is hitting a nerve with people who are watching and it is so important. I wish we had many more hours to continue. I'm going to ask one last question and ask for brief remarks. And then I'm going to take us through and ask of everyone who is watching to participate and help create change. As everyone knows right now in Vienna, there are talks happening about trying to re-enter the Iran deal or the JCPOA. My question for the panel, and I'd love quick comments on this, is what do you think some of the biggest barriers facing the Biden administration are when it comes to lifting sanctions? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. I mean, I once I, I was on a panel with a uh, uh, an official from the Office of Foreign Assets Control, which is the is the body in the Treasury Department that administers U.S. sanctions. Um, and this was at the tail end of the Obama administration. Um, and, it, you know, I said, you know, you guys are, you guys aren't doing really embargoes anymore. You guys are doing very targeted sanctions. Uh, and it, it appears that's a shift away. Um, and, but, you know, you need to explain, you still have an embargo and broad-based sanctions against Iran, against Cuba, against North Korea, um, Syria, et cetera. You know, what's the explanation for that? And the explanation given was, well, those programs have somewhat been grandfathered in, meaning politically, we don't feel we're capable of lifting it without seeing substantial resistance from Congress. Um, you know, otherwise, we would feel comfortable moving towards a more tailored, a more targeted sanctions program that you know identifies those bad actors in a given country rather than imposing you know a blanket sanctions program on the entire country. Um, and really, you know, that's the you know, to the extent that we see continuity between the Obama and the Biden administration, it's a lot of the same people. Um, that would be the hurdle to them, you know, you know, e imagining an even broader sanctions lift than that that may be contemplated under the JCPOA. It is not the case that, you know, where it, where they are in Vienna and the U.S. is taking a look at all of its sanctions and what sanctions it will lift as part of the JCPOA. You know, I don't think it's necessarily the case that they're looking at saying, OK, we're going to maintain these sanctions because these sanctions are important to U.S. interests. What's really going on is they're taking a look at these sanctions and they're saying, well, these ones we can't politically do back at home. We're scared about the political blowback if we lift these sanctions. Otherwise, we'd be perfectly OK with lifting them because we're not we're unclear any longer as to what the U.S. interest is in maintaining them. And I think that just gets back to advocacy here at home um, and being able to put pressure on your legislators to be you know, in the media talking about these issues, um, to be organizing people on the ground um, and really making you know, a, a, a substantial pushback to those who believe that these sanctions somehow serve US interest. Anyone else wanna make a brief remark on that before I go to our call to action? I just wanna, rephrase what Tyler said in, um, a little bit because I think what he said is dead on but I think that there's this notion that um, <clears throat> something that looks like harsh and punishment is always the right way to react to bad behavior but what we've seen for example when we're talking about the regional um, the regional dynamic of Iran's bad behavior in the region is that as soon as the Biden administration came in as soon as they said, we're not going to support Saudi Arabia and its war in Yemen, and we're not going to, and we're going to return to diplomacy. Um, these two regional powers, which are causing a lot of problems in neighboring countries, um, started having, you know, diplomatic talks because the, the stake for uh, the, the, when the environment and the course and the tools change, then it changed for everybody. And the US sort of sets the precedent on what the tools are. 
So if the tools are always punitive and hostile in the region, because if those are the tools the US use, the rest of the region will apply that. So returning to a commitment to diplomacy, to um, a, diver a diversity of sticks and carrots, as they say, I know some people think sticks and carrots is no longer the in terminology, but that allows for a shift in policy. But if you just say we're going to sanction someone, we're going to punish them, it's very easy to say they're doing a bad thing or what we perceive as a bad thing. So we're going to punish them. The other thing is that the narrative is in around Iran uh, nuclear program has been a false narrative and everybody has contributed to it. Iran has not had a weapons program since 2003. They discontinued it on their own before there were sanctions, before there was international pressure. It's when they no, no longer felt the strategic need to have it. No intel US intelligence agency or the IAEA or anyone has ever found any evidence of a weapons program. To the contrary, their assessment is that the Iran has, has never made a decision to initiate one in these years. So we have to start telling the truth too about what the policy is about. And if the policy is about regime change or it's about cornering someone that you see as a regional out, um, a regional competition, we need to say that's what it is, as opposed to sort of just work on these false narratives. And um, Iran has come to the table and they have reached an agreement and that agreement should be honored and they should use that same opening to um, address a whole range of issues, civil political rights, broader sanctions relief, you know, um, regional peace and stability and all of those things. Brilliant. Thank you all for that. I want to turn and also share a little bit about what everyone watching can do in order to support with sanctions law relief. There is three key things we've learned from this conversation today. Broad-based sanctions in Iran are having devastating impact, including on civil society. Meaningful sanctions relief is crucial and is urgent. And if the US returns to the Iran deal, the Biden administration is going to need political support to lift sanctions. Key to that political support is high-ranking Democrats like Senator Menendez, the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. He's already teamed up with Lindsey Graham and expressed doubts about returning to the Iran deal. He's building a national profile with his foreign policy work, and we need to create a national response, especially when he is getting in the way of the kind of diplomacy that will lead to meaningful sanctions relief. That's why today we're asking everyone on this call to sign a petition to Senator Menendez, urging him to support diplomacy with Iran. Amy, can you please bring up the slide with the petition link? Now, if you have already signed this petition, please share it with your friends. There are buttons on the site that will make it very easy for you to share this across different platforms. And also, if you're looking for other things to do in addition to this, follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, join our email list. In the coming days, we're going to be giving you all more actions you can take to support with sanctions relief and also to support with diplomacy in Iran. There was a question about what we mean when we say win without war. And what we mean by that is, centering policies that aren't around violence and looking at collaborative multilateral ways where we can solve global problems like the and engage in diplomacy. So I wanted to name that. And I'm going to end by again, thanking all of our incredible speakers. Please, if you don't already, follow them on social media, support their work because it is so crucial in our ecosystem. Thank you to everyone who is watching and for all you do to create change. And I am looking forward to marching alongside all of you as we continue to push back against collective punishment and instead build towards diplomacy. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, everyone.